It's always a privilege to be back in Australia, one of my favorite countries in the world. I had somebody ask me, if it was up to you, what part of the world would you live in? I said, well, I grew up in South America. South America happens to be my favorite continent. And I would be delighted to live there the rest of my life. But if I was only being selfish and only thinking of me and where I would live, I would probably live in Australia. But God has given us a mission in the world and we can't think of ourselves and where it's more comfortable. We have to think of where people need us the most. And my wife and I have spent uh, our childhood, uh, about 10 years of our childhood and about 30 years of our adult, adult life working in Latin America and some of that in the Caribbean. And we are grateful for the opportunity that our parents gave us to have grown up in a foreign culture and to have learned the language and to become uh, locals in more than one culture so that we can uh, reach people uh, much easier. I, I have grown up with a, um, a grandfather who was a pastor in the southeast United States, southeastern United States, and my father uh, who was a pastor pilot, my mother was a nurse, and it was just always my goal to be like my parents. And my in-laws also have uh, spent most of their life working in denominational service, and, uh, and so it was natural that we would just dream of, of working for the church and being missionaries. Uh, our parents gave us a good example, and we trained to be like our parents. My mother, a nurse, my father, a, a pastor, pilot, nurse, and I became like my parents, a pastor, pilot, nurse too. <laughs> and uh, we have to say that are the best years of our life have been serving God, working in the church, serving people, and, uh, and in his work. There was, there's nothing else that has been more rewarding. I want to thank uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church for all those wonderful years of service that they allowed us to give. But there came a time uh, teaching graduate business classes for Andrews University in their extension program down in the Caribbean, down in Trinidad and Tobago at, at uh, what is now Southern uh, Caribbean uh, University. I, I uh, was teaching a class and I gave my graduate business students uh, a homework. And we studied, we were studying management information systems, uh, which is computer systems, business, and of application. Because since I have, I happen to have a graduate education in the area of software engineering as well as business, I was combining those two. And I gave them a homework about what would happen if you were a big company in the, in the, in the world and how would you make your plans for the next 10 years? Well, they all went to do their work and we started evaluating that and we realized there was some major things that have happened in the world that were going to bring major changes very soon. We didn't know the exact date, but we knew something big was about to happen and it would affect the entire uh, global economic structure. And, and when I began to realize the implications of what we were studying, I went home and talked to my wife and I said, the whole way we think as a people, the whole way we live as individuals, the way we work as a church is going to change. And most of us are not ready for those changes. And as we began praying about it and seeing what, um, what we could do, what the Lord might lead us to learn, we were led into doing some experiments, which we will go into. We will talk about some experiments we did with our life. I love experiments. And those experiments were very adventuresome, very dangerous. You risked our life and we went through some very difficult problems. But that experiment has lasted nearly 18 years now. And even while we were serving the church, we were uh, carrying out our experiment. And I want to be able to uh, tell you about that experiment and apply it to these to this last, last generation, to this last few years, things are happening very fast. And today, I don't think it's a news to anybody that the, the world is going through trauma. Would you agree? You can see it on every channel. You can read it on every newspaper. You can read it on every magazine. Uh, you can hear it on the news every day. There is global crisis in the world today. But uh, before we begin, uh, it is my habit to always ask you to bow our 
our heads for prayer and ask the Lord's presence. And we, at the end, we will, we will finish by having a, by a special prayer of consecration on our knees. But if you will just, if we could begin, just bowing our heads right now, uh, let us ask the Lord's presence. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. We want to thank you tonight for the very special privilege we have of being together in this place. We want to thank you for the holy hours of the Sabbath that are beginning now, 24 hours of special time set aside to be with you. It is a very special time throughout the universe as the seventh day begins and as we uh, enter your presence and we ask that you will honor us with your presence in a special way. We ask for special protection against outside interference to our thoughts. We ask that your holy angels surround this, your house tonight, and that all evil influences be removed. And we order that in the name of Jesus and through the power of his blood that was spilled for us, that every evil influence be removed at this time, eliminating outside thoughts and helping us to hear your still small voice as you in love speak to us and prepare us for the coming final battle of earth's history. And we thank you, Lord, for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I learned to pray before each sermon, asking the holy angels to surround and to eliminate evil influences. Because I discovered, this is just a little anecdote, I discovered when I was speaking for It Is Written, uh, 10th anniversary for the French It Is Written, Il est écrit, in uh, Canada, uh, I was up there uh, celebrating their anniversary. The director speaker had asked me to come. And I was up there and there was a pianist, a French pianist from Haiti that was just playing lovely music. And when I found out his story, I discovered a beautiful uh, testimony of how he has been threatened, he has been tempted, he has been bribed, everything attempted, of course, uh, bribes to get, to get him to play worldly music in church and one of the most powerful spiritists that claims to control a good part of Canada and the Caribbean uh, of evil evil spirits at her command told him that whenever he plays that music the evil spirits were not able to enter into the church but if he could play a little jazz a little rock a little rhythm for church service, then the, the, her angels could come in and sit in between the people and interrupt their thoughts during the service. And she said, if you don't do it, we will kill you. And he said, well, I'm protected. I've made a, I've made a covenant with the Lord never to bring in worldly music into my, into my uh, concerts. He's a concert pianist and a professional. And so they threatened, they offered to pay him and everything, but he wouldn't. And his story was very, impressed me that we need to pray for God's protection. And when we come into church, we don't want any outside interference. We want the Holy Spirit to speak to each of our hearts directly because we, it's too late in history to be thinking of things that are unimportant. It is time to focus our attention on the most important things that God has for us. And I hope that this weekend will, be, will bring us a lot of those subject areas and that you will be greatly blessed. We uh, uh, began our experiment nearly 18 years ago by taking to, taking to the Lord uh, our petition and saying, Lord, how can we learn to depend on you and not on our paycheck? Because the church, the church doesn't, uh, I never had a missionary salary that made me rich. I, we never made that much, but it was sufficient. And they took good care of us. However, when all human support is cut off, we won't have a, a paycheck. And you can't transition from total dependence on a paycheck to total dependence upon God just like that. So what, what is the, the procedure? What does God have to do to teach us to be dependent on him. Well, I'm, I'm, I, didn't, I don't have the book Early Writings with, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the um, Early Writings is one of the ones I normally read, but I have a, another one here, Testimonies and um, uh, Experiences of Sister White. And on chapter 31, uh, Traveling the Narrow Way, there are a few thoughts uh, that um, bring us to mind. See, this is Christian Experiences, Christian Experiences, um, chapter 31, and traveling the narrow way gives us a few principles. Now, I, 
I, I, principles apply across all cultures. Principles apply at, across all times. It can vary from culture to culture, vary from language to language, how the application, but the principle remains the same. And so here, is, here are some of those principles. I'm reading right here. Uh, a portion of this assembly, she says, I was in Michigan and I saw, dreamed of a large body of people. A portion of this assembly started out prepared for the journey. We had heavily loaded wagons and as we journeyed, the road seemed to ascend. On one side of the road was a deep precipice. On the other side was a, a high, smooth, white wall. As we journeyed on, the road grew more narrower and steeper and in some places it seemed so narrow that we concluded we could no longer travel with heavily loaded wagons. Now, what is the principle? When God's people start on this trip, they have all their belongings with them. They have, they have their air conditioning in the car. Um, they have heat on when it's winter time. They have their iPods, their iPads, their computers are with them. They have all their things in comfort zones with them. That's a heavily loaded wagon. Just like if you would go on a trip and you took everything you could with you. But the road gets more narrow, and it gets tighter, and pretty soon they conclude they cannot go on with everything they have. Now this is at the beginning of the trip. You know how it's going to end, don't you? It doesn't end the same way it begins. There's a procedure of starting out on a trip, but as you go along, there's restrictions along the way, and you have to make some choices. It says, as we progress, the path still continued to grow narrow. We were obliged to press close to the wall to save ourselves from falling off the narrow road down the steep precipice. As we did this, a luggage on the horses, I'm sorry, I missed, um, it says, then we loosed, we loosed the baggage, um, we then loosed them from the horses, and took the, the, the carriages, loaded wagons, and we took a portion of the luggage from the wagons and placed it upon the horses and journeyed on horseback. And as they traveled along, they, 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 the luggage pressed against the side of the wall, and it says, uh, to save ourselves from falling down in the steep precipice, as we did this, the luggage pressed against it, and we feared that we would fall and be dashed in pieces on the rocks. We then cut the luggage from the horses, and it fell over the precipice. Okay, here's the second stage of the learning process. You, you go with everything you have, no changes in your life, you take everything, like when you go camping with a big camper that has everything in it, you just plug it in, it has a toilet, it has everything in it. But eventually, they had to go on horseback. But even then, with a few, now you know, at that stage, when you go from a heavily loaded wagon to a horseback, you have to leave some things. What would you leave? Think about it a little bit. What things would you leave behind if all you had was one horse? Well, there's some equipment you'd have to leave behind. <laughs> you'd have to leave some clothes. You'd have to leave some equipment, your library. You'd have to choose maybe a very small amount of electronics to take along with you in our modern age. Uh, you'd have to leave a lot, just the very minimum. But then, as they travel along, they feared even that would be too much, and they had to cut the baggage loose, and the baggage fell down the precipice. Now, how much did they have left? Their phone on their side, that's about it. Okay? As the path grew more narrow, we decided we could no longer with safety be on horseback, and we left the horses and went on foot in single file, one following the footsteps of another. At this point, the small cords were let down from the top of the pure white wall, and these we eagerly grasped to aid us in keeping our balance upon the path. The path became finally so narrow, we concluded that we could no more travel safely with our shoes, so we slipped off them off our feet and went some distance without them. When, when, we, when then, we then thought of those who had not accustomed themselves to privations and hardships. Where were such now? They were not in our company. At every change, some were left behind, and those only remained who had accustomed, accustomed themselves to endure hardships. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're on that path today. Absolutely, we're on that path. We started the path nicely in the 1990s. Those of us that remember the times when things were going pretty well, but there wasn't a talk of crisis in the world, pretty well things were prospering. 
uh, we had, there was extra funds available in the 90s, 70s, 80s, 90s, things were going pretty well. But as we progress uh, these last few years, the world has been growing in its level of agony. In fact, the last few years, I've been watching as the nations are getting tenser or more tense and more tense. And, the, you know, you realize that just a few weeks ago, we could have entered the Third World War. If the U.S. would have attacked Syria, Russia said it would have attacked Saudi Arabia. And once you get four nations at war, what's to keep it from being six and ten and twenty? What, what is happening in the world today is that the, the, Satan is trying to engage the world in a premature war and something very interesting is happening. I used to read this story and not understand it, but I think I understand it much better now. You remember that, that the angels began to release, the four angels began to release the winds and it says in Revelation 7 that a mighty angel came out of the east and said, Hold! Well, if you read the Spirit of Prophecy version, you find out that Jesus said to his father, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. And so God give, the God the Father gives an order to hold, and then the angel rushes to earth and says, Hold the winds. What we witnessed just a few weeks ago was those four angels holding the winds a little longer. But why are they holding it? This is the important thing. Why are they holding it? Revelation 7 says, until the servants of God are sealed on their foreheads. As we're on this path going, and I think of Jesus ministering, we're going to talk more about that. Um, it is true, uh, what Brother Brian told us earlier, that this is the only appointment I have accepted this year, but that doesn't mean I haven't been preaching every week. It just means that I felt impressed this year to be very flexible and to go wherever God sent us. And we've been preaching almost every week, sometimes many times in a, a week, uh, wherever we happen to be, be it Europe, nearly for five months this last year, we were in Europe, visiting all the different countries and working with different opportunities, be it South America, be it North America. We have been very busy. It's just I have not had appointments on specific dates. This is the only one that I've accepted for this year, where I, for this date to this date, I've accepted to be here. And, and so, as, as we traveled everywhere and as we worked everywhere, we realized the people of God, many of them, they don't even know what's about to happen. And they're not even on this path of preparation. They're not learning to experience hardship and privation. They're struggling to actually move ahead in life in order to get more comfortable. But God's people today, who are on this path, are not getting more comfortable. They are getting more uncomfortable. If you are getting more comfortable, or if you're striving to become more comfortable, and to position yourself for a better future, you're not on the path. It's just that simple. You're on a different path. And the reason Jesus says to his father, Lord, my blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Why? It's because he knows that if the angels release the winds now, his dear children, his dear sons and daughters that love him, that keep the seventh day, and many who don't yet know about the seventh day, but we're talking about the, his Sabbath-keeping people today, those children, most of them would be lost. Because, you know, once, once the winds blow, it is not time to get ready for the crisis. Once the winds begin to blow, it is time to separate the wheat and the chaff. That's why you have a shaking period before. The shaking period, what is that for? That's the preposition. Have, have any of you uh, um, ever had to grind, not grind, but do rice, I don't know, peel rice or peel something? If you've been in another country, they do it by hand and then they hold it up like that and the wind blows out the chaff and then they, they pound it and pound the, the rice or the, or the wheat and little by little the chaff is blown off. Well, the process of separating the chaff and the wheat is a pretty painful process. But once the winds begin to blow, it's too late to get ready for the crisis. It's separation time. If you're not ready for the crisis, it just means you blow out. 
and you leave. And Jesus loves his people so much that he says to his father, please, not yet, not yet, hold a little longer. So what we witnessed a few weeks ago is the four angels holding the winds of strife a little longer so that you and I can get ready and be ready so when the wind blows, we're not blown away. It takes a preparation process. And this is the preparation process we're reading here. This little narrow path that in which you have to learn to depend more and more on God and less and less on your things because your things need to be, need to be released to God. And you say, but how do you release your things to God? Very easy. You kneel down and you say, God, everything I have is yours. What do you want to do with it? Some people tell me, but I've worked hard for these things. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the problem with what the devil tells us. They belong to you, the devil tells us. They, be, they belong to me. They don't. Nothing that you have belongs to you. Are you aware of that? You, you know that your next breath doesn't belong to you? Your next heartbeat doesn't belong to you? It's a gift of God? So if your breath and your heartbeat don't belong to you, why would you be able to own a car and a property? Think about it. Those are even less important than your breath and your heartbeat, right? We, we were born naked. We came into the world without anything. And everything that we have, more than that, is given to us by God to manage. Everything. Our education, our families, our assets, our, our influence. Everything is extra. We didn't come into the world with that. It was given to us. And so therefore... As managers, we should go to the owner and say, Lord, these are your things. That house, that car, that property, that education, that influence, this family, whatever you've given to us, it's really yours. How do you want me to manage it wisely for you? As we acknowledge his ownership, first of all, let me ask you, is, is the Bible clear about who owns the world and the gold and the silver? Huh? Haggai 2.8 says, for all the silver and all the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay? And Psalms 50. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Because all the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. The, God is very clear who owns things. So am I, am I giving you biblically solid uh, teaching there? Yes, God is the owner of everything. We would agree. There's no, there's no doubt. We are told by the devil that we own things, but we don't. We're just managers. So therefore, we go to God and we say, it's yours, what do you want me to do? And keep your eyes on God and follow the Lamb wherever He leads. And you will find that God is leading His people all around the world today. I, I, uh, do I have my... No, I left it in my briefcase. I have a, a pretty big, thick passport. It's one of the thickest passports. In fact, every time I go to any country, immigration officers go, wow, this is a volume. <laughs> and... With so much travel, it's, it's, it's pretty thick, and the U.S. Embassy has added pages three times to it. Actually, they added a double portion one time and another single portion another time, and then he told me, we're not supposed to add that many, but we did it by mistake, so you have a very extra thick passport. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. I appreciate that. It makes it last longer. And, and so, so I have this big, thick passport, and everywhere I travel in the world, I find the same thing happening among God's people. There's crisis today among God's people especially those that have their eyes focused and are following the Lamb. If you are interested in following God right now, He's not leading His people into comfort. He's leading them into greater and greater dependence on Him because that's the only thing that's going to hold us through that final time. So we, we, we went uh, to the family, to our children, and we said, children, we'd like to learn to depend on the Lord. And uh, we've, we have been praying about it and uh, your mother, myself, we believe that after we finish this school year uh, the, at the university teaching there, we believe that instead of going back to the U.S. as we had planned, that we should go spend one year deep in the jungles of South America, in Guyana, and let's just, as a family, let's learn to depend totally on God. And if God is unable to keep us alive, I have tickets here to go home. Oh, you have little faith. Anyway. At the beginning of the trip, you know, your faith is pretty small. So I, I had enough money to buy tickets, and I had my ticket money reserved. The general conference had given us money to do that. And so I said, well, if, we're, if everything comes to worse and God cannot keep us alive, we leave. But 
Deep inside, we knew God's not going to fail. He's going to teach us. I'm not sure how we're going to survive, but we'll see. The children agreed. The girls were worried if there were snakes. We told them, yes, there's a lot of snakes. The boys said, oh, goody, goody. The, the girls wanted to know if there was any running water. We said, absolutely. You take the buckets and you run down to the river and you run right back. <laughs> so... We went as a family, and fortunately, my son-in-law, I'm sorry, my brother-in-law and, and my sister-in-law and their, their children, they came down to join us. So we actually had a, 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 a double family experience, not just my immediate family, but also my in-laws. And eventually, my father and mother-in-law came down to spend a little time with us. It was really, really nice. But we lived out of 200 miles deep in the jungles. Now, no salary, no benefits. Nobody, no, no telephone, no internet, no refrigerator, no electricity, except for a solar panel to have lights. And, and we decided that we were just going to depend on God. Well, this, is not, this experiment doesn't last too long, because after a few days, you have to get hungry. God has to either provide money, I mean, sorry, he has to provide food, or not. It's, it's simple. There's some things in life that define themselves rather fast. And so we get there, and we will either have food or we won't. Well, a day went by and we started to get hungry. We had a little bit of food leftovers that we brought in, but then the little Indians kept peeking through the window and they would run home and tell their parents everything that those white people did. And one of the things they told them is, the white people don't eat food. <laughs> what do you mean they don't eat food? I don't see them eating. A couple of crackers or anything, but they don't prepare meals or anything. So then our neighbors came over and said, Excuse me, uh, do you not have food? Well, actually, we don't really have very much. We came with what we had, but it's not very much. We paid for our tickets, and that was about all we could. An airplane flew two hours and dropped us off in the jungle. And, and so the, the next morning when we got up, there was a big basket of fresh fruit and vegetables sitting on our doorstep. We took care of their spiritual needs and their physical needs in the medical field, and they took care of our physical needs. It was wonderful. And every day, enough food to eat. And they went and they worked very hard. And they were so grateful to have us. They said, we'll provide what you, what you need. Just tell us what you need and we'll do it. We're just thankful to have missionaries here. And especially we're thankful to have uh, nurses, prof medical professionals that can help us take care of our malaria, our, our complications and deliveries when the women have problems and, and emergencies and so on. So we took care of each other and I began to relax. You know, when you get in your comfort zone, you quit growing spiritually. And so, uh, once the food was taken care of, I said, oh, Lord, I don't have to worry about anything. Everything's taken care of. I'll just get up every day. The food will be there. We'll just work. We're going to have fun this year. <laughs> and then, and then uh, some other Indians, Amra Indians, came to see us from another village. They walk, they walk, 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 walk. And they came over and they said, would you be able to come, Pastor Gates, to our village? I said, sure. Where do you live? I was thinking, you know, like, uh, well, we're about 15 minutes from here. It's not very far. It's only four days walking in this direction. <laughs> and I could just imagine myself walking for four days, spending one day there and walking for four days back. Just to visit them, it would be eight days walking to be able to visit them for one day. Or you could go there and spend a long time in another village and I asked the other captain, where do you live? Oh, two days in this direction. And I could realize I would never be at home. So I, I began to pray for an airplane. If the Lord could provide an airplane, then I could go visit them in 15 minutes. I could spend the weekend and come back in 15 minutes. And as I was praying for the airplane uh, and kept praying for, for several months, the, uh, the patients started coming in. They used to carry them for days. They brought in this lady in a hammock. They'd carried her for two days. Her husband and had gone with her on a trip. They both had malaria. The husband died along the way. So they buried him along the way. They had to bring them over a cliff and pull them up with a hammock over the cliff and then carry them to our village. And the first thing I said, Elder Gates, please heal this patient. And I thought, well, I, I'm not a healer. <laughs> I can't just boom, knock them out, you know. It's not the gift that I have. And, I don't, and, and some, some evangelical healers hit them on the head and they fall down and it looks like they're healed. But, but that's not God's way of doing things. So I said, I am a nurse. And I know as a nurse what I can do for malaria, but I don't have medication for malaria. 
And, and I told the Holy Spirit, I don't know how to save the lady's life. I was praying. And, and the Holy Spirit reminded me, you have $300 under your mattress. I, hold, hold, hold it, hold it, God. <laughs> that's, that's my money. <laughs> that's in case my children or my wife or myself would get bit by a snake. Or if we get malaria, we will call an airplane. And that airplane will come to get us. And that is our emergency way out of here. And the Holy Spirit said, I didn't ask you to come here to take care of yourself. I thought you came here to learn how to depend on me. Yes, but isn't it normal for a husband or a, a father to have a little bit of something for the family? David, you came here to depend on me. But that's all I have. I don't have any more. Give it. Call the airplane. Save the lady's life. It's not very fair. <laughs> at least $300. I mean, at least 300 And all his superior said is, it's your choice. Do you want to learn or don't you want to learn? Yes, I want to learn. Okay. So I called the airplane, brought the medicine, saved the lady's life. But then I was rather upset at the Lord. You know, who said it was easy to learn? I mean, is it going down a narrow path, give, giving up your suitcases and things? Is that easy? No, it's not easy. Uh, nobody said it was easy. But it's hard to, to become a bodybuilder. And building faith muscles also takes pain. No pain, no, no gain. So I, that took me, that was very painful for me to give up my last $300. And I, and, and I really, I told God, I'm just not really happy with you, you know. That's, <laughs> your training is a little too painful for me. But I, I learned one lesson. You don't have to agree with everything, but, but if you want to learn, you have to obey. You can, you can be griped, you, can, you cannot understand, you can say, I don't. Whatever your feelings are, it's okay, but you have to obey. So I obeyed, but I, I did it in a bad spirit. And for two weeks, I was quite upset at God. It's not fair. And then one day, we, an airplane circled, came in for landing, and I ran up to see, why is an airplane coming? And as, as this airplane touched down, this white lady got out of the airplane because most everybody is either uh, of African heritage or indigenous. And so they're either kind of uh, dar dark-skinned um, red, Asian, or they're African black, and you rarely see any white people. And so, as this white lady got out of the airplane, I went, oh look, there's a white lady. <laughs> and the white lady got out of the airplane, oh look, there's a white man. <laughs> and I found out she'd, she'd come in from uh, New York, she'd been a little girl in Guyana years ago, and her father was an Adventist doctor, and she'd flown all the way from New York, and she just decided to take a vacation, and she paid for the airplane to take her out there just to spend a couple of weeks in this little jungle village where she had visited when she was a girl. So I took her suitcases, offered to take her down to our house. She went down, and she helped my wife in the clinic for, for two weeks. She was ready to go up. I don't even remember her name anymore, but do you remember her name? My wife, huh? I'm not sure if it was her or one, somebody before her, but it, it's, it, it was one of our first visitors. And, uh, and I took her suitcases back up to the runway, and I waited for the airplane to come. And as the plane was circling to land, she just asked me a question. She goes, Brother David, uh, uh, do you accept donations? Um, well, um, well, you see that, yes. It never occurred to me because I didn't come to an Indian village to ask for donations and we weren't going to ask anybody. But when she put that out, I said, well, I mean, if she wants to do it, but I said, yes. And, and so she said, here's an envelope for you. And at that moment, I knew I had my $300 back. And, and so I was feeling very badly. I said, Lord, I've been complaining for two weeks. And, then, and she got in her airplane, waved goodbye and took off again. We never saw her or heard from her again. And, and as I took the envelope out of my pocket, and I said, Lord, I know you put the $300 in here, and I'm so sorry for complaining. I mean, I just didn't think you would send it all the way from New York. 
out into the jungles. I mean, it's, that's not normally possible. How do you get cash 300 miles deep into the jungles? And as I opened it up, I started counting, and inside was $1,700. And then, the, and then the, the verse flashed into my head. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, and running over. <sighs> I don't know if you have a hard head like me. But that's how we learn to trust God. We learn to trust God by letting go and doing what God tells us to do. As God asks us to share in our local church with evangelism, or maybe with a neighbor, or maybe by by supporting one of our young people that goes overseas to mission work, or maybe going, like some of you have, to the mission field yourself. Whatever it is, or helping with medical needs, or helping with another sister or brother who's going through a difficult time. Whatever it is, it's not about accumulating, it's about letting go. This, on this path, it's all about letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. Even your shoes and your socks, eventually. You understand what, the, the principle? There is no other path, brothers and sisters. There's only one path. The path that leads to heaven leads every time, every, every day into a more narrow, restrictive, more difficult path that only you and God can walk together. You can't even walk with another person eventually. You're single file. You know what single file means? Like my wife, my wife broke her knee some months ago in Europe. She fell down and and she's just barely beginning to walk normally again. But she likes to hang on to my arm when we walk. On that path that leads to heaven, eventually, it's only you and God left. You don't walk as a family. That doesn't mean you don't have family. It just means that you will be tested individually. You will have to make a choice for you. You can pray for each other. You can support each other when you're, while we're still together. But eventually, it will just be you and God and your destiny will rest on if you are able, yourself, to depend on God. Maybe your wife can. Maybe your husband can. Maybe you can't. Maybe your choices will, have not led to more dependence on God. You will eventually leave God's people. We don't want to leave God's people. We want to stay on that path, don't we? And the only way to stay on that path, but every, it says at every turn, some people left. Every time there was an increased trial, some people would say, I'm out of here. This is too hard. Well, I determined to stay on that path. And uh, as we went on, and eventually we had our little airplane. I've told this story before in other sermons, but I, I learned another lesson. When I went to the States to look for an airplane, I didn't have enough money to buy an airplane, but I felt impressed to go look for it. And I found just the right airplane, but it was too expensive. I couldn't even imagine God giving me enough money to buy an airplane. That expensive. So I looked for a smaller one. And it was still too expensive. So I looked for the worst one. One that the, the engine wasn't running. The instruments didn't work. There was no paint job. The tires were flat. It did not have any brakes. I said, that's the one I want. My justification in my mind was, I know you need an airplane, but if you're going to ask God for something, don't, don't push it, David. Don't ask for too much. Because if you ask for too much, God may not give it to you. Ask him for the worst, and he can't say no. That's, that was what I started out with. God is not going to give me too much because he might want to teach me to be humble. So I'm not going to ask for a good piece of equipment. I'm going to ask for the worst piece of equipment, and God cannot blame me for being too aggressive. And, and I'm sure God was in heaven talking to Gabriel, and he said, look at David. I wanted to give him something better, but he's not asking me for something better. Give him what he asked for. The day that I went to look at that airplane, a lady handed me a check to buy the airplane. And I went, I could have asked for something better. <laughs> I got just enough to buy that airplane. It took me a year and a half to fix it up. And you still, it's still in a mission field. We still have it. It's been a no lovely little airplane. It has worked hard over the years. But <laughs> we have learned that it's a little on the small side. All the other airplanes we've got now have all more capable to carry a little more, carry more weight, carry a stretcher or whatever. And so I've stopped asking God for the worst. I don't ask him for a brand new one, but I just said, Lord, I want something that works, something that will do the job. So every time I ask for God, I've learned that God will give you the things that you need to work with. 
It's not because it's for you. It's because God's work requires equipment and tools. Sometimes properties. Sometimes it buildings. Sometimes it's just dental instruments. Sometimes it's video projectors. Sometimes it's computers. Sometimes it's television transmitters. Whatever it is God, God's, work, God's uh, work needs, ask Him for it. But first you have to give up what you have. If you haven't done your part, God will say to you, you haven't used what I gave you already. But once you've given God back what you have, ask God for whatever you need. God is not, God is not. You think there's, how many of you believe today in heaven there's an economic crisis? Anybody? <laughs> there's not a crisis in heaven. There is no crisis. Not that kind of crisis. If God needs money, he knows where to find it. And if he wants to give you a tool to work with to evangelize, well, what if you started praying for, like, in, let me tell you a story about Russia. Uh, I, was in, uh, I was invited twice last year to go to the Caucasus Union uh, in southern, su southern Russia. And the ASI president and the ASI secretary contacted me for Russia and said, the Caucasus Union would like to have you come they heard you speak at ASI, they've heard the recommendations, and they would like for you to come and speak to all of their pastors and then to all of their church members in three conferences. And I said, no, 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 I'm just so busy. And they kept insisting and insisting. I said, T take, my, take my assistant. He, he can go. But they turned him down for his visa. So they kept back to me again. <sighs> okay, I really don't have time. But I'll come. And you know what? It turned out to be some of the, one of the highlights of my life. I went to Russia. I've always heard, I've always heard about, you know, uh, the Iron Curtain and the Russians versus the Americans and all the tension. I go, why would I want to go to Russia? But when I went to, to the Caucasus Union, I found a people that were ready to work for God. They just needed encouragement. And so one of the things I told them is, did you know what? What is it you need the most? You know what they said? We need one million great controversies. That's what we need. We need one million great controversies. And I said, then God will give them to you. All you have to do is ask. We don't have enough money. That's not God's problem. Ask God for one million great controversies and God will give them to you. Why would he tell you no? Would he tell you no when you're asking for materials to save people? No. No. So you don't have enough money? Do what you can with what you have, and what you don't have, go to God and say, Lord, we don't have enough. So they started praying. You know what they told me? They told me they prayed. They called me so full of joy, and they said, God has promised that he's going to give it. We don't know how, we don't know when, but he gave us his word. You will have your million great controversies. So we're just rejoicing in the Lord, and we're preparing for massive evangelism. Isn't that beautiful? What a wonderful testimony. You don't have to have money to think big, you just have to know God. And when you've put everything on the altar and you've sacrificed already, you can go to God with a clear conscience and say, Lord, I need this for your work. And God will find a way to do it. I'm just, I'm just so thrilled that we serve such a great God like that. God doesn't even care about a global economic crisis. He laughs at global economic crisis. He doesn't, the nations to him are as nothing. He loves people, but is God impressed by a big nation? <laughs> the whole world. He just, <laughs> the world. He spoke. And it, and it was. The sun. The sun is so much bigger. <laughs> you know, there's the sun. And there's, and there's some stars that are billions of times bigger than our sun. And he spoke them into existence too. So God laughs at the problems of the nation. Not laugh because he thinks it's funny. It's just a phrase. He doesn't feel any tension over the fact that we have economic crisis on this earth. Because all he has to go is poof, and there's all the gold and silver. In fact, if you want to know the truth, he's probably already put the gold and all the silver in its place that we need to finish God's work. He already knows where it is. Do you think God is suffering stress because he doesn't know how to pay for his work? 
God already has it planned out. Well, I'm sure that when he made... Hey, by the way, here's another interesting anecdote. You, you're aware that the world is getting health-wise more dangerous, right? I mean, with all the genetic modifications and all the new types of viruses that are coming out and new types of diseases and the new threats to our health. And some of them are, are threats that are made up. I mean, human-made, you know that. And others probably come from other types of sources that are not made up by humans. But in any case, it's getting the human race is under more danger today than ever before. And did you know that God already knew that? And, and if you study natural health remedies, you will find new remedies that nobody knew about that are perfect cures for these big problems we have now. God built it in at the very beginning, knowing that we would come to this very last generation and we wouldn't have any answers. So God just designed the right plant and he just put it there. And for 6,000 years, nobody knew that that little weed was the cure for a disease that hasn't existed yet. God already has it all planned out. He already knows how to finance his closing work. He already knows how to finance it. Money has never been a problem. The problem is people. And what God is looking for is a people to trust, that will trust him. So we went to the Bible and we said, Lord, we want to follow the principles. So we went, we went to Matthew 10. And we said, Jesus knew how to send his disciples out. How did he send his disciples out? Matthew 10, verse 5. These twelve, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not forth in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of it, to the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here is two principles right at the beginning. The first thing he said, Don't go to the Gentiles, which are the pagans. Don't go to the Samaritans, which are your evangelical friends. First, go to the church. Go to the church first. And they have a message to hear. The message is, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the message today is exactly the same. If I ask you to raise your hand, almost all of you will raise your hands. How many of you believe that Jesus is coming back soon? It's always the same in every Adventist church. But if I ask a different question, prove to me that you believe Jesus is coming back soon. By the way, you spend your money. Ah, that's a little harder to do because you see, I just bought a new car. I just bought a new property. And you see, I, I'm planning on investing and becoming, I have a new business opportunity that just came up. And so I'm just, I'm expanding and hopefully I can retire very comfortably. If you were on a Titanic and you were cruising along in a beautiful, lovely day, not like today, and your daughter, son or daughter, had to practice their piano. And there was a piano available. Would you, would you tell them to go ahead and practice their piano? Good thing to do? Yeah, on a normal day. Would you make the bed when you got up? Did you make your bed this morning? If you were on a Titanic and it was a beautiful day, you got up, would you just leave it the bed unmade or would you probably be a good idea to make your bed? Good idea to do your normal habits. What about washing the dishes? Hmm? Good idea. Yes, do your normal activity. But what if the Titanic struck an iceberg? And what if the Titanic started to lean over? And what if everybody was getting into lifeboats and you decided to practice the piano and wash the dishes? Is that normal? It's good to practice the piano. It's good to wash the dishes. It's good to make the bed. But if you're doing that, at the moment the ship is sinking, people would say, you're crazy. You do not do those kind of activities at the moment of emergency. If there is an emergency, you have to prioritize your activities. Now, you understand this is only symbolic, what I was saying. It's only a story to illustrate the fact that in times of emergency, Normal behaviors are crazy. How, much, how many of you would say, agree with me today, that the world is in an emergency? A very fatal emergency. Can you raise your hand? 
That's definitely the majority. Would you agree with me, therefore, that normal behaviors today is somewhat crazy? <laughs> There's a story told. There's a web page called grandpappy.org, I think. And I found it doing a little surfing on the Internet. He's, the guy is obviously an engineer, and he's obviously an MBA, a master's in business uh, administration, and he's combined his skills to make some suggestions. Grandpappy gives you an idea he's a grandfather. So he's an experienced older man. And he tells a story on his webpage. This is a North American. And he says, North America, living in North America, can be compared to riding a comfortable bus. And I would say probably the same thing could apply to Australia. You're riding a comfortable bus. There is air conditioning. There is food. There's TV. Everything you need. And you're going on a long journey. All of you together. And then somebody stands up and says, Ladies and gentlemen, straight ahead, there is severe icing. And there's a hairpin turn on a downhill stretch. This bus will never be able to make it around that hairpin turn because it cannot break and it'll go right off the cliff. Those who want to survive must get off now. But the people look outside and they see it's sleeting. It's cold. There's ice outside. It's miserable. How can you survive outside? Inside here there's, there's heat, there's comfort, there's everything you need. And outside it's very hostile. And then he said, yes, but if you don't get off now, you die. But on the other hand, if you get off now and you're not prepared, you die too. He said, ladies and gentlemen, we in North America are riding this bus. And if we do not prepare, and in, if we do not get off the bus, and we do like everybody else, we're going to go into that straight stretch, downhill, with a hairpin turn at the end. But the bus driver looks at everybody, they look at the bus driver and say, is this guy telling the truth? Oh, says the bus driver, the U.S. government. Don't worry. We've been driving here for a long time. And I've never seen such a situation. Just trust me. And the drivers look at the man. And they look at the bus driver. And they look at the man. And the man is putting on his jacket, putting on his raincoat. He puts on all his things. And he tells the bus driver, please stop. I'm getting off. And he gets his little bag of food, and he gets his everything, and he holds an umbrella, and he has a little tent, and he got all his little things together, and the, bus, the people just look as the bus stops, and the driver says, you're crazy, man, you're going out in a cold weather, you're going to die. He says, I know, but I'd rather live than die on a hairpin turn. So he gets off, and he walks out into the cold. But he's dressed for the cold. He has his right clothes, he has a tent, he has a jacket, he has some food, he has some water, he has whatever he needs to survive, but it's miserable, and it's not comfortable, and it's difficult, and it's painful. Everybody else stays on the bus, and they continue their journey, and you know what happens. They go into the straightaway, they cannot stop, and they go, as they go off the cliff, they say, we should have known. This is what the world is facing. And God sends his people, and he says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get ready. Get ready. Jesus is coming back soon. Everybody agrees today that something is about to happen in the world. People are looking for answers. But you cannot drift into it. You cannot float into the final crisis. You have to be ready if you're going to get off the bus. You understand, right? If you just walk off the bus like we are tonight, out in the rain and the snow, what? you die. Getting ready. So the first, the first principle here is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then uh, you go on here in verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely have received, freely give. 
Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass for your script nor, nor um, script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, neither staves, for the workman is worthy of his hire. And here we have some very interesting principles. We applied these principles. One is, freely have received, freely what? Give. How much did Jesus, how much did Jesus charge to heal a sick person? How much? Nothing. How much did his disciples charge for healing? That's strange. Don't, 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 don't they have money needs? Did the disciples need money? Food for their family? Peter had a mother-in-law, so he must have been married. Of course they needed. They were fishermen. They used to fish, and they used to sell the fish, and they'd have an income, and they used to take care of their family. But Jesus called them away from their money-making and said, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And Lord, how do we make a living? How much do you, how much do you, can, can we get paid for this? Nothing. And how much should we charge? Nothing. <laughs> this doesn't make good business sense. But that was the thing we had to learn. How much did we charge our patients in the little clinic out in the jungles of Guyana? Nothing. How much did they charge us for food? Nothing. How much did I have to pay for the airplane? Nothing. It was a gift. How did I pay for the gasoline? It was a gift. Every month, enough money to pay. I didn't have any income. I didn't have a salary. God gave me what I needed to keep flying. And that's how this principle, these, we applied these principles. Our very first attempt to learn how to trust God was take our families and just go into the world and just trust God. And it was painful. We went out into the cold. We went just with barely enough. But you know what we found? God is more than sufficient. If you choose to trust God, if you choose to reach out beyond your capabilities and give your neighbor, give, give God's work or give, give a needy person or be involved in evangelism or be a missionary yourself or whatever God leads you, that's up to God. He will tell you how to do that. God is the owner, right? One thing, never, never let it be said. David Gates told me to do this. I hear rumors all the time. David Gates tells people to do something. No. I'm asking you to go to the owner. Isn't it safe to go to God? Can, can you trust God? If you go to God and say, Lord, you are the owner. Tell me what I should do. Can you trust God to tell you? Of course. Will God tell you wrong? Will he deceive you? No. He will tell you exactly what you need to do to start building those faith muscles. And it will be outside of your comfort zone. <laughs> it will be. Will it be a little difficult? Of course. If somebody wants to be an athlete or somebody wants to be a weightlifter, I was in, I was in Peru uh, a few months back during the Olympics, and I was just going into a grocery store, and I, I said, look! Look at that man! He, look! Whoa! He's lifting up 300 kilos! And I saw that man pick it up and <clears throat> press 300 kilos. I go, Phew. And the bar went, mm. And then I said, let's see how much, let's see, let's see what they say. And they said, women's weightlifting competition. <laughs> oh, that was, I thought that was a man. <laughs> she was so big and so hefty that I could not tell if it was a man or a woman. But she pressed 300 kilograms. Now, if somebody was trying to be a weightlifter, would you say there's a lot of pain involved? Would you say that? What about, what about any one of the Olympic competitions? A lot of pain? God is looking today for Olympic athletes. He's training a special core of people today that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. A special team of people that follow the Lamb everywhere He goes. And where does the Lamb like to go? To the cross. Hmm? I just got a little thing on an email the other day. A friend of mine sent it to me. And he says, all the martyrs have their... What, what do they have at the, at the bottom of their white raiment? A red border. But you know what? The Lamb is different. The Lamb doesn't have a red border. He wears His garments dipped in blood. 
We only have to have a little bit of border. But Jesus was baptized in blood. Very different than we humans. He, he paid the ultimate price. And so if you want to follow the Lamb, I can tell you where it leads. <laughs> it leads to the cross. But it's the only way, if you're going to stay on the path, isn't it beautiful that a cord was let down from heaven? Isn't it beautiful how God just provides a solution? And it gets bigger and bigger. And as they go down the path, as the path gets more narrow and more narrow, the cord gets bigger and bigger. Your confidence, your ability to trust God, God's provision gets bigger and bigger. And pretty soon they say, who holds the cord? God holds the cord. That was the answer. And they just grasped it with all their bodies and they put everything on it and they swung across to the other side. Brothers and sisters, God's people today are on that path. And to be honest, we're not at the beginning. Some of us are at the beginning. We should be far, far along that path. We're so close to the final crisis, so close, that if we don't have a cord in our hands and we're not learning to depend, it is almost over. We are nearing, uh, on September 10 of 2001, I was standing in Atlanta speaking to the Southern Union Legal Association. I had approximately 500 lawyers from the union, all over the union had come. And I was this featured speaker. And I told them, one of these days, what we know will change completely and we will live in another world, another North America, totally different from the one that we've lived in. We don't know when, but one of these days, everything will change. And I did not know that the very next day would be September 11th. So I'd like to repeat what, I'm, what I said then. One of these days, we'll enter a different phase of Earth's history. The winds will begin to blow and God's people will come under direct attack. We'll be under severe stress. When that time happens, it is too late for you to learn to trust God. That time is today. And we will talk more about that tomorrow. In fact, it's exciting news. God is preparing His people today by giving them evidences of His power and care. But today, the door is open. Someday, the door will be closed to God's people who would not enter, but it will yet be open to those who never knew. But today, it's open. Aren't you glad it's open today? I would like to invite you, if tonight you want to make a special covenant with the Lord, saying, Lord, I need to be trained. I need to learn to trust you more. I, I, I just, I want, my, I want myself and my family to be totally dependent on you. And we want to start along that path. And we want to recognize, keep our eyes on the Lamb. And we want to start letting go, letting go, letting go. And as, just lead us wherever you lead, want to lead us. But we want to remain on that path and we want to be ready. So when the winds blow, we have a cord in our hands. If this is your choice tonight, I would like to invite you to come forward and we're going to have a special prayer consecration. I'm going to make different calls throughout this weekend for different specific decisions. If tonight you want to be on that path, learning to depend and willing to let go and learn to trust God for everything, and you want that more than anything else, would you come forward? And we're going to kneel down the front. Once we're all here together, we'll kneel down and we'll, we'll have a special prayer of consecration. Just keep going forward if you have room ahead of you so others behind you can come. The wonderful news is the door is still open. It won't be open very much longer, but it's still open. And it's a wonderful time to start on that path. And we have a faithful God. And our God is loving and He loves us so much and more than anything else. Three weeks ago, He held the winds for us, for you and I. Aren't you grateful? How wonderful of our God to hold the winds for us so that we can get ready. If you're able to, unlike my wife that can't bend her knee, <laughs> if you're able to bend your knees with me, would you kneel with me please as we consecrate ourselves to the Lord? Heavenly Father, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you for making us aware of the love of the power of the angels that are holding the winds so that your Holy Spirit can finish preparing us for the great crisis. Today is a day of opportunity, a day of salvation. But we have so much to learn yet. We want to learn total dependence on you. We want to have that cord in our hands. There is nothing in this world that we have or own that will carry us through. Only our relationship with you. Everything will be taken away. Everything will be lost. Nothing will be kept. And it will always someday destroyed. But the relationship of dependence on you will carry us through eternity. And we want to continue that relationship. But first we, gotta, we have to acknowledge, Lord, that we want to place control into your hands. Everything we have, everything we own, everything we are, we just lay on the altar tonight. And we ask you to take full control and lead us along that training process that leads us to the new Jerusalem. And may that cord grow in our hands, bigger and bigger. And may our muscles, our ability to hang on and trust you, grow stronger and stronger. Every family, every person, individual that's made that decision, tonight, Lord, circle them with a double portion of angels dressed in armor, marching in perfect order to protect us from the evil one, physically and spiritually, and train us to let go, let go, and let go. It's necessary. There's no alternative. Those who do not learn that will no longer remain with God's people. It's as simple as that. We can resist it. We can fight it. We can deny it. We can do whatever we want to. But the fact is, those who do not learn to depend on you will no longer remain with God's people. And that is such a, such a terrible thought that someday some people who knew the truth will realize they made choices to stay out of heaven. Lord, not us. Tonight, we give ourselves to you and we thank you for forgiving us for waiting so long. Thank you for holding the winds of strife so that North America did not attack Syria and that Russia did not attack Saudi Arabia. Thank you for holding the winds in a thousand of other ways that we don't even know about so that we could have a little more time to train and to work and to save others as well. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit. Give us a blessed Sabbath evening of blessing and tomorrow we pray for tomorrow as well. In Jesus' name, amen.